Komla Afeke Dumo, Afeke meaning the root of the family, was born into a family of recognized educationists. His paternal grandfather, Michael Dumo, was a pioneer in the Catholic education project in the Volta region beginning from the 1930s. His maternal grandfather, Philip Beho, the indomitable music master of Achimota School, was the composer of the incomparable national anthem of Ghana. This was a tradition that emphasized the value of education, a drive for knowledge, the pursuit of excellence, and services to one's country. Komla was born on the 3rd of October, 1972, to Professor Ernest Dumont, a highly respected academic and a public servant, and Cecilia Dumont, born Miss Beho, an educationist curriculum expert and an editor of international repute. Komla's parents taught him the value of sacrifice and love for the country through their own professional work. His father was responsible for building the Ghana National Identification Systems and the Regulatory National Identification Authority established to manage the system. Any child in Ghana who has been to secondary school in the last 25 years has been touched by Komla's mother. She almost single-handedly supervised the production and edited all 50 standard school textbooks, even though she was then chronically ill with an insidious disease called rheumatoid arthritis. Komla was born into a Catholic family and was brought up according to the teachings of the Catholic Church, particularly as to the sanctity of family and marriage. He was nurtured to internalize basic Christian virtues of humility, charity, diligence, patience, kindness, and temperance. He lived these virtues in his family and professional life. He was strong and firmly grounded in his Christian walk, and he would say ever so often that whatever God had endowed him with must be shared. The above is just part of the kaleidoscope of Komla's heritage. However, Komla was taught not to relish in the achievements of his grandparents, parents, and recognized family members, but to carve a niche for himself by applying creatively the gift of heritage. As a result of these influences, Komla, through his own passion for good, justice, and fair play, and a concern for the poor and disadvantaged, involved into a masterpiece of God, cherished and loved by his family and friends, and admired as the boss player in his professional life. Early life and education. Komla grew up on the campus of the University of Cape Coast and at three and a half insisted on joining his sister to attend preschool at the university primary school. In 1975, when his parents left for the United States of America, he began his formal education from K-1 at the United Methodist Church. He was mit admitted into the Spartan Village School where he began his real educational journey. In 1979, Komla and his older sister joined their father in Tacoma, Seattle area in the state of Washington. He was enrolled in Wildwood Park Elementary School in Puyallup and then Daffodil Valley Elementary School a year later. The years with his father created a very intense bond between them. But those years remained significant in Komla's early life because as a black African child in a racially polarized environment, he came face to face with a much more concealed yet dangerous form of racial discrimination. At that tender age, 
Komla had to rely on the support of his parents to deal with this widespread problem in the American school system. With the right encouragement and family support, Komla dealt with the racial obstacles by working extra hard on his school assignments. He was made to cultivate the habit of reading and spent quite a lot of his leisure time with his nose in a book. He read books that told the story of slavery in America and the profiles of great American achievers. Komla realized very early that in the face of extreme difficulties, these achievers got to the top by pursuing a disciplined life, excellence, and a hunger for knowledge and perseverance. When Komla reached the fifth grade in Daffodil Valley Elementary School, he offered to participate in the Interschool District Spelling Bee competition. His teacher at the time, who stereo stereotypically thought Komla was only fit for sports, dismissed him in a simple wave of the hand. His parents protested, and the school allowed him to contest. Komla confounded everyone by reaching the finals and eventually becoming the first runner-up. Komla had set the stage for himself and his family. This African family was now constantly on the invitation list to potluck lunches and dinners. In the Sumner community, Komla was also the star footballer on the only football team the kicks. He came home with a lot of trophies awarded to him. He was equally the star athlete. With the help of his mother, Komla learned to play the piano and soon became a star performer in his school of Western classical music. To widen the intellectual horizons of Komla and his siblings, the parents organized educational tours which took the family to Canada, the Great Lakes region of the United States, a journey from the Pacific Northwest all the way to the Eastern Seaboard. These were great opportunities that allowed him and his siblings to have their imaginations run wild and stimulated them to always consider greater possibilities. In 1983, Komla's parents left the United States of America for Kano State, Nigeria. Much to the anguish of, him, of himself and his siblings, Komla had no choice but to relocate to. On arrival, Komla's parents realized that his intellectual growth needed to be nurtured differently, so rather than place him immediately in Kano State system, he and his brother were placed in a personalized program run by a lady from India called Mrs. Sato. It was a driven program meant to draw out of children their full academic potential and set them on a course for excellence. In this period, the parents took a decision not to have a television at home. This was initially a sore point for the children, but they, later in life, they would always concede that this was the best thing for them at the stage of their lives. In 1984, Komla was admitted into St. Thomas Secondary School and placed in Form 2. He went through the prescribed academic program successfully, graduating at the top of his class. He took the Nigerian Joint Admission and Matriculation Examination for admission to any of the Nigerian universities at that time. The results of the examination placed Komla in the band of students who could be admitted to start a pre-medical program. He was only 16 years old. It was an extremely hard decision for Komla's parents to see him leave home so young and at such an impressionable age. It was hard for Komla himself, but with his sister in the same institution, he launched into his Tetri educational journey. So it was, Komla entered the University of Joss 
in Plateau State, Nigeria. After four years of training at the preclinical studies, Komla abandoned the program and returned to Ghana. On his return home, Komla indicated to his parents that he wanted to pursue a law degree and then specialize in forensic science. The parents thought the idea was great, but switching from a science to an arts-based program was going to be fraught with dangers. The university authorities recommended that Komla take a degree in the arts or the social sciences. Without hesitation, he agreed and entered a program in sociology, psychology at University of Ghana for a bachelor's degree. Broadcast career. Komla at the multimedia group Joy FM. In his first year in the University of Ghana, his sister drew his attention to an advert in the newspapers requesting applicants for a position on air as a traffic reporter for the fledgling station Joy FM. The show and the interview were held at the program sponsor's office, Mobitel, a telecom provider. Komla showed up at the interview to find over a thousand people waiting for the same position he had come to interview for. A friend took him to the interview room where Komla told them to stop the interview and send everyone else home. He was the man they wanted. They liked his smile and his confidence. He got the job. Little did they know that for national service he had worked on radio at the Ghana Broadcasting Corporation a year earlier, doing an early morning program called Everyday English. His broadcast career thus took off on the back of a motor scooter, riding around Accra at 4 a.m. every morning, giving reports on traffic in the capital. Soon thereafter, Komla was noticed by the management as an individual not only with a voice for radio, but very much in control of the English language and very much informed on issues of public policy. This was essentially the bridge on which Komla walked into the position of presenter of the Joy FM Super Morning Show. Komla's place as the driver in the emerging market of private radio and its transforming power in support of democratic practice and its ethos will remain legendary. He handled every aspect of the program with consummate professionalism. He took on major national development issues that many of his colleagues felt afraid to handle. His engaging personality, confidence and passion for evidence, setting the contours for public debate, endeared him to many Ghanaians, irrespective of political affiliation. Komla found the Super Morning Show the biggest and the best platform to fight the cause of the ordinary people of his country who remain the poor in the face of chicanery, sophistry, of the so-called moral crusaders in the country. Komler's investigative skills led to the exposure of one of the biggest dens of corruption. He was prepared to pay the price, and in his appearance at the Commission of Human Rights and Administrative Justice, this will remain a point of reference in investigative journalism. For the many things he had done, the Ghana Journalist Association nominated him Journalist of the Year in 2003. This award offered Komla's detractors in the community of journalism to declare resolutely that he was not a journalist. As Komla himself, in an assessment of this period in his career, told his parents, ignorance is blissful, but painfully, many people suffer as a result of it. Komla at the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard. Komla was always hungry for knowledge, 
Therefore, he took the opportunity to enter the prestigious Kennedy School to study for a master's degree in public policy. In a letter Komla wrote to his parents, he stated the following. The academic program has been rigorous and intense, but I have coped very well. I have generally topped my class in most cases and developed some really good relationships with some professors. Last week alone, I got back four papers and the worst grade was an A minus, which is quite remarkable considering the fact that Harvard uses the forced grading, grading curve system. Komla graduated at the top of his graduating class and became the valedictorian. Soon after his graduation, he was offered a position at Brown University in the Africa Leadership Program. This was a program established by the university to allow former heads of state in Africa to spend a year reflecting and writing their memoirs. Before he could accept the offer, Kwesi Chum, the CEO of Joy FM, arrived in Boston to plead with Komla to return home to take back the Super Morning Show. Komla returned and rebuilt the morning program and raised the bar even further. Komla at BBC from to the world's newsroom. In 2006, Komla was again invited to join the BBC African Service in London as host of the radio program Network Africa. From 2008 to 2012, he presented the world today on the BBC World Service. In 2011, he began presenting the world news and Africa business reports on BBC World News Television. In a list published in the New African Magazine, he was named as one of the 100 most influential Africans of the year 2013 with the citation, it has been a coming of age for Komla Dumont this year. The presenter of Focus on Africa, the BBC's flagship and first ever dedicated daily TV news program in English for an African audience, broadcast on BBC World News, has established him as one of the emerging African faces of global broadcasting. As a lead presenter for BBC World, Dumont has considerable influence on how the continent is covered. At the time of his death, Komla was the only West African newsreader on the BBC World News. In the words of BBC Radio 4 Today and BBC News presenter Michelle Hussein, Komla developed his own unique on-air style, seamlessly moved between TV and radio, and influenced Africa coverage across the BBC. He was also described by Peter Horrocks, the BBC's global news director, as the leading light of African journalism, committed to telling the story of Africa as it really is. He conducted interviews with a wide range of high-profile figures, including our very own Kofi Annan, Bill Gates, and famed author Chimamanda Adichie. The many important news stories that he anchored, including the 2010 World Cup in South Africa, President Barack Obama's trip to Africa, and the funeral of Nelson Mandela. BBC editor Solomon Mugera looks back at his short but brilliant career and writes, Komla Dumont was the face and the voice of Africa. A new, young, enterprising, and internationally connected, ambitious Africa, African with a can-do attitude. When pioneering the launch of Africa Business Report on BBC News, he set out to challenge the stereotypical view of Africa. He was passionate about telling the story of how the continent was changing, of rapid economic growth, and technological advances. But he was not a praise singer. 
He was determined to present a balanced story, warts and all, and to show the human face headlines. Even as a number of African countries were being heralded for being among the world's fastest growing economies, he wanted to dig deeper. For he knew that while in these countries a select few are whining and dining in five-star hotels and driving the latest luxury cars, in the same neighborhood, there were families struggling to live on a dollar a day. There must be balance, or please don't patronize me, he used to say. Despite his towering figure, he never came across as intimidating, unless you were a politician with something to hide being interviewed by him. He loved people because he believed stories are about people. To tell a story well, you need to understand people. But he didn't see people in terms of mere contacts. He saw people as human beings and collaborators in a mission to tell the African story. International broadcasters, including the BBC, have often been accused of being coy to promote black African talent. But with Komla, the BBC got it right as he smashed through internal and external barriers. BBC TV now boasts many African presenters and reporters. In his short career, he changed so much. He will be sorely missed. Hire the best talent to tell the story, or the view is great from the, my hotel. Komla Dumont on telling the African story at a TED Talk in 2013 personal life. In 2001, Komla married Kwansima Kwansa, with whom he had three children, Elenam Makafwi, meaning God has always been there for me, praise him, 11 years old. Elom Efazinam, God loves me, he comforts my heart, nine years old. And Emefa Araba, I am at peace three years old. His love and devotion to these three children was his greatest mission. And he often said of all the professional and personal nicknames he had, the m name he most loved and cherished was that of Daddy. Death. Komla died on 18 January 2014 in his London home, having been on air the day before. His body was flown back to Ghana on the 3rd of February, 2014. Family, friends, led by the Chief of Staff, representing the President of the Republic of Ghana, sympathizers, and members of the Aflawo Traditional Council, who also pre perform traditional rites. Komla, my little big brother, rest in peace. I'll always, always love you.